Hey, I don't, Dustin, I don't like how you, um, you know, we're here right at 8 o'clock. Man, we got a good one. We got Sean Bird's song. What's up, man? How you doing? Trey, what's going on? It's been, what, you know, almost a little over two months? Right, right. How, how have you been doing since? I'm doing good, man. Doing good. Just trying to get get used to this new, uh, you know, situation that we're in. Can you uh, hear, hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, you know, this uh, this new, um, I guess, I guess pe pe people are saying this new norm that we're in. Yeah. Um, but you know, other than that, I think uh, I've been hanging up pretty well. How about yourself? You know, I'm I'm doing well. I think it's you know it's gonna be. It was a little bit of an adjustment period for me because, um, you know, I was in Australia first. Um, so when all this kind of started happening, I got, um, you know, I got to Australia right as kind of everything started getting a little more serious. Right. Um, and I spent only 12 days there and was kind of sent back before you know, um, before I got stuck there. Um, but for me, it's been it's given me a chance to really reflect and you know, on myself and become more self-aware and just, you know, become a better friend. Um, Cause I'm, I'm really, um, you know, I kind of just sit back and realize that, you know, I know I deal with mental health stuff, but I know I have friends that do as well. So I need to do my job and um, especially during times like these. Right. Right. What would you say has been the best part for you? So for me, like I just said, it was like, I'd sit back and reflect and, you know, that's really helped me out. What, what would you say has been your favorite part about all of this? Um, I think it's two things. Uh, the first thing would be, you know, getting to sit back and actually relax, um, and think more about, yeah. you know, planning wise, um, you know, things that we want to accomplish, um, you know, you know, our goals, things like that. I think it's before the situation happened, you know, I think for myself, um, everybody's always on the go, you know, you're working, you're traveling, you're doing things like that. So you really can't find time to like really calm down, I guess, until like the evenings, even if yeah. you can't do that, you know? Um, but I think for the most part, yeah, just uh, being able to relax. And then the second part of that is, you know, being, you know, with, you know, my, my daughter, and it's almost like I'm um, daddy daycare. Yeah. You know what I, mean? <laughs> so, I mean, really, so it's like, she's on a, She's on a schedule, you know, and uh, it's, you know, you're uh, reading, you know, got to keep her reading yeah. because actually her, her uh, daycare is shut down as well. So um, not only are the schools out here, you know, in Kansas City shut down, the daycare is shut down. So, you know, I talked to, you know, her, her, her mother and we kind of worked it out like, hey, you know, you're working from home and everything. I can go ahead and take on that, like, you know, full time. Um, to like be with her while you're, you know, working everything. So it was kind of like a blessing, really, just being able to see her, you know, grow and like sort of the activities they do at school, you know, she's like, you know, <laughs> bring them to me, you know, and say, yeah, daddy, daddy, you know, circle time. You know, I'm like, okay. So, uh, listen, so I know all about circle time being a preschool <laughs> teacher, so I already know what she wants. Right. So we got circle time. And I'm looking like, okay, so we're getting, it's like me and her and her stuffed animals in a circle. <laughs> And it's like, uh, it's amazing. And then on the flip side of that is, you know, just, you know, mother babies and the usual. So I think yeah. th th those, those are the two uh, most important things right now, being with her every day, being able to keep her on track, and then also just being able to reflect and sit back. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of people during this time can, um, you know, really look at themselves and be like, you know, I really got to keep working out because... You know, I know if I don't, I can get set back. I know it can, you know, mess with my mental health. What have you been doing to stay active? Honestly, with her. Yeah. You know, I've been with her um, pretty much. I try to get out and walk, you know. Uh, we can get out and walk, you know. We, we have a trail that, you know, we can go around and you know, around the block and all that. You know, I like to, um, you know, still exercise as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, even though they've shut down all the gyms, parks, so I try to get out still um, and, and get some exercise that way. 
Oh. How old is she again? She'll be three oh, in July. Great. Yeah. Great age. So, so it's, it's funny because she has a tricycle. And when she's, you know, going up the hill and everything, I'm actually walking and pushing her on her tricycle, you know, on her long tricycles. Yeah. But she's actually the one, you know, moving her legs. So we get to yeah. a certain hill and we go around the pond. And, you know, she wants to see the ducks and all that. You know, we come back around. She's like, <laughs> daddy, daddy, uh, get on my, or can I get on your neck? Can you carry me? Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I'm looking at her like, <laughs> really, you must be worn out. Yeah. You know? So I think, yeah, that's a good part. Everybody can still get out and exercise and, uh, around the neighborhood. And What would you say is your favorite part about being a father? Uh, I say seeing her grow, mm -hmm. you know, seeing her grow. Um, and I think, you know, just the, the smile, you know, girls are, girls are different, you know, like I've been around a lot of kids and everything like that through, throughout my life. Um, but girls, you know, I, I have a soft spot for girls. Yeah. You know, uh, especially young girls, you know, and it's just, um, especially being a, you know, a dad, I think that, um, you know, the young girls need their dads in their life. And it's like they, I mean, of course, sons need their dads too, but it's still like y young girls really need their dads in their life um, to really like guide them and things like that. So I just like seeing how she, you know, looks at me. And even during this time of quarantine, um, like I said, I feel like I'm a, substitute teacher yeah <laughs> you know like every day um but i think i think it's really good you know although i'm not a father i would say that's the same thing um for me that i love most about being a preschool teacher is seeing children grow and in, in the different goals that we set for them at the beginning of the year and you know you mentioned those smiles too just seeing those as well as you know there's it's priceless right um, although they're not my kids you know i care a lot about my students right um you're the son of um, of Otis Birdsong, four-time All Star um, and a gold medalist. How was how was that growing up for you, being you know being his son? You know what was that like? Um, actually, it was unique. Um, and I say that because you know my um, well backtrack. My mother, you know, she's from Kansas City, and my dad and my mother met when he was playing with the Kings here in Kansas City. So they got married um, before, um, you know, they moved to New Jersey. And that's when I was born. So the unique thing was, yeah, growing up and having, you know, guys come over to the house, you know, going to the games, going to the practices, things like that. Um, that was fun, you know. And then I think, you know, around the time I was, I believe I was like eight years old and they, uh, they divorced. Um, but they said it to where even though they divorced, we would still see my father throughout the summers, spring break, Christmas break, and all of that. So it was almost like we never really skipped a beat. We primarily, you know, myself and my younger brother, Sydney, we lived with my mother, you know, came back to Kansas City with her. Um, and we, you know, pretty much still had that relationship with my dad. So even when I was growing up, um, going back down there with him and after he, his playing days were over, um, we were still, you know, with, with him being in Houston, I think at one point, um, Kim Olajuwon, um, Mario Ellie, you know, Clyde Drexler, a lot of those guys would come to the house. And I was in middle school at this time. Yeah, it was a middle school. So I was looking at these guys like, okay, well, that's Clyde, Akeem, and Mario Ellie. But I guess to the world, they're like, yeah. <laughs> you know who these guys are. And I really couldn't appreciate it until I got older. But I think, yeah, it was it was a good experience in that way of being around a lot of guys uh, playing-wise um, that I really didn't understand it at the time, being a young kid. But as I got older, I got to. And, you know, like a quick story, like when I, when I was in, uh, we were in Boston. My dad's last year playing in Boston. Um, Larry Bird actually hurt his back. And they brought in my dad to, you know, be that, that guy to come in and replace Larry for that playoff push. And I remember going to Boston and being in those practices, you know, seeing like, you know, Larry, of course, didn't practice, but he would sit up on the top part and watch. And it'd be like Kevin McHale, Dennis Johnson, and Robert Parrish. And I was at an age to really understand, yeah, these are the Celtics. Yeah. You know? And I was like, it was crazy. Like, I'm in the locker room, and they're, like, writing on the – or, you know, um, Jimmy Rogers at the time was the coach. He was writing on the board and things like that. So I kind of started at that time, like, really appreciating, you know, basketball to be like, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool, you know. At that age, who did you look at, you know – 
and, you know, you met him and you're like, wow, he's like really cool. Was there anybody that like really stuck with you at that age? Um, it was a lot of characters. I think really, um, the late, you know, Daryl Dawkins, uh, AKA chocolate thunder played with my father in, in uh, New Jersey. He would come over to the house and hang out. And I just remember him being just so funny. You know, he was just like a, you know, his, his character was just, you know, off the charts, like maybe laugh all the time. Things like that, you know, of course, you know, Mike Ray Richardson, you know, those guys being funny. Um, I think playing wise, you know, somebody I really like looked at. Um, I think everybody was kind of the same to me when I was in elementary school. Mm -hmm. But I think once I got to middle school, of course, Michael, yeah. you know, my, my, Michael Jordan wasn't really a favorite because I still looked at him like, you know, to this day, like the videos and even back then watching it was like, yeah, my dad. And him had battles, so I couldn't yeah. look at I couldn't look at Michael as to me the mm -hmm. best player because you're going back and forth. Yeah, with my dad, <laughs> you know. So I like you know Magic and those guys, but I think growing up high school wise and all that, I looked at Kobe um, because I can actually see the game, appreciate it, and be like, yeah, you know. And he's he was only you know four years older than I was. Um, so I think Kobe Bryant to me was the epitome of like my favorite basketball player to me. Um, but I, you know, all those other guys, yeah, they, they were definitely great. In their so own you way. got to, you got to see Jordan. You obviously got to see Kobe and you obviously got to see LeBron. You right. got to start one, bench one, cut one. Start one, bench one, cut one. So I would obviously, to me, I would, <laughs> I, I would, I, I would start, that's tough. They're all great. Um, I'd say Michael. You start him because, for one, Michael paved the way. You mm -hmm. know, he's the he, he's the guy who Kobe looked after, and then even coming behind Kobe was Michael looked after him. Um, I'd have to say, bitch, you know, Kobe, and I would have to probably leave LeBron because. Oh. <laughs> oh, only because with those three, like I said, only with those three, it's tough. But with those three, it's like, and Michael even said it himself, you know, Kobe, like I said, he said himself, this is my opinion as well. Kobe mirrored his game after Michael. Mm -hmm. So you're really getting two for one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, you're giving two for one. LeBron is great as he is. Yeah. You, you really don't want to leave them all, but it's like, if you have those three, you want the original, and then you want the one who came behind him who said, you know. Yeah. Um, I, and Michael himself said, yeah, he's probably the greatest thing to me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in, in that respect, I would say, uh, yeah, start Michael, you know, and bench Kobe and bring in <laughs> take, take on LeBron. <laughs> Growing up, did you have, you know, pressures to follow in your father's footsteps? Honestly... No, I never felt pressure. Um, I heard the pressure, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, m meaning basically, you know, I was always taught at a young age, you know, yeah, I, I was told, you know, your, your dad played in the NBA, you know, you're going to, if you want to do this, you're going to have to do this. So they kind of grew me in a way, like thinking about it wise to already be prepared. I think the outside noise came from probably, you know, probably kids in school. Um, outside coaches or things like that. It was like, oh, well, um, oh, that's such and such a son, you know, um, you know, he needs to do, or, or he, he, he may not do this, he may not do that. So it was almost like the expectation was from other people. Yeah. But putting pressure on myself, um, it wasn't any kind of pressure from myself to uh, meet any kind of expectations because he told me from a young age, he's like, listen, I've, I've had a career for myself. You know, I did this for myself and my family and everything. So I, I used to always think it was weird that he used to always tell me, you don't have to play basketball. And I'd be like, what do you mean? And he'd be like, you don't have to play basketball. And it didn't dawn on me until after I got older. And he was just like, basically saying, I had to play basketball because I loved it, of course, but he had to, you know, pretty much get out of their situation yeah. that most, most, most people have at that time. And even still do today, but you know, more so, you know, back in the in the in the sixties and things like that, he really wanted to provide and do things to where when he got to that point, 
it was like, okay, um, my kids don't have to play sports they don't want to because we've kind of, you know, in a way provided um, him and my mother a, a way of other options, I guess you can say, with um, do doing other things in, in basketball. Now, I heard stories that you were a ball boy. <laughs> not when he was playing and not really in the NBA. So I was a, I, I was a, uh, what I would do was like when they would have the celebrity games, mm -hmm. uh, when I was younger, like I remember in Houston one year, they had had a like Penny Hardaway, Nick Anderson, had a celebrity game at Hawthorne's. And uh, Oscar Robertson, he had a celebrity game back in the day when they were playing. And some other greats that were playing. Um, I was a towel boy. <laughs> and what I would do is just like, you know, young kid running around. I would sweep up, you know, whatever, <laughs> throw the towel. But I was never a ball boy, uh, per se, like, like in the NBA. But yeah. it was really like a lot of those celebrity games and things like that, which a lot of those NBA players would still, you know, come out, play in the summertime and things like that. So we'd be around just like helping out, throwing t-shirts and, you know, st stuff like that. Yeah. Non-basketball players, do you remember any celebrities that you met that really like stuck with you? When I was younger or just even yeah, today? Yeah, when you were younger. Uh, Lawrence Taylor. Um, it was actually ironic. His daughter and myself actually went to the same uh, elementary school. Nice. Um, in New Jersey, um, I would have to think, you know, it's been so many people, you know, like Roger Staubach, football player, um, a lot of people, Nancy Lieberman, the great WNBA player and, you know, yeah. women's basketball player. But as I got older, um, and I'm, I mean, really younger was just pretty much the sports, but as I got older, um, you know, Jesse Jackson and, J.B. Smooth, you know, comedian, a lot of comedians, D.L. Yeah. Hughley, uh, Safety Entertainer, Mike Epps, you know, a lot of comedians and, you know, uh, people like that uh, as I got a little older. Yeah. You, you ended up playing at Lincoln University. What would you just, well, one word to describe your time there? Interesting. Interesting. And I say that honestly uh, because – you know, growing up in a way kind of like how we did, um, you know, it was kind of like, I want to say it was, yeah, well, it was kind of a sheltered environment, but it was also, we were exposed in a way of uh, AAU when I played, um, you know, eight before, before Lincoln AAU basketball. Um, so we're exposed to different cities and cultures and things like that. But in our neighborhood, it was honestly just, in the suburbs and you know when i went to lincoln you know historical black college you know it was honestly for me an adjustment i love the school you know and i ended up growing into the environment i loved the you know uh the school and, and things like that um even basketball wise it was great um experience you know coach terry you know he really pushed us hard you know it was a good experience um but that was kind of like i said unique situation you know i had to um it's funny how i chose lincoln was i had two offers after high school well i had like three or four division one offers in high school and then i broke my foot um when i was in high school my senior year so i had to go you know junior college for two years then i'm going to lincoln but the only division one school i had left um at that time was umkc which is a mid-major d1 here in Kansas City, they used to be in the Mid-Continent Conference. And the coach told me, say, hey, we'd love to have you, but we're not going to guarantee that you're going to play that much because we have these other guys coming in, mm -hmm. and especially, you know, come off of injury and everything. <laughs> I was like, well, I want to play. So went to Lincoln, you know, worked out with them, and they were just like, you're going to play, <laughs> you know, it's Division Two, but you're going to play against Mizzou, Missouri State, in these other Division One schools, so it's gonna be kind of the same. It's not gonna be all year Division One, but you're still gonna get your opportunity. So I was like, well, look, at that time I want to play, you know. So I chose end up uh, choosing Lincoln, and it worked out. You end up playing in the Premier League. What was that experience like for you? PBL was cool. My first year professionally was in the CBA. 
Um, and that was in Atlanta. And I really mm -hmm. liked that because I had, um, I had never been to Atlanta before. Um, I love the food, <laughs> you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of things to do down, down in Atlanta, a lot of food and the, you know, that culture down there. Um, and then I ended up going to, uh, yeah, the PBL, um, I was down in Oklahoma and then I was also, uh, fortunate to go to a uh, DC and I played in DC with the uh, Beltway Bombers. So I think the minor league itself as a whole, CBA and PBL, it really, one, it humbles you. And it also makes you work harder mm -hmm. because it's really a, in my opinion, and the coaches will tell you too, it's a cutthroat business in the minor league, meaning there are no guaranteed contracts. And we were reminded of that all the time, <laughs> you know, playing yeah. like this is the NBA. It's not the D league. So you can have 25 points one day. And if you have like maybe four or five games and you're off, you can be sent home. Yeah. That's just reality. So while it was a good experience as far as like really mentally, I guess you can say, um, really learning how to be a professional. You know, it's not the glitz of the NBA, um, but it was still you're learning how to play the game still. You're working on your game, whether it's, you know, shooting, ball handling, passing, you know, rebounding, you know, pretty much whatever your position was, which you need to work on. And I think that uh, I think that was good for me, learning the game more playing in the minor leagues you you started coaching you know a little bit later on what was that transition like from going from playing to coaching was that a tough transition for you um I would say it wasn't really tough for me because it was still basketball mm -hmm. you know and I was always taught as a young age you know it's more than one ways to skin a cat <laughs> so you know somebody told me that a long time ago and I always stuck with me for one reason for, yeah. for, uh, for, for whatever reason but yeah i mean i i feel like playing it was it was great but i had opportunity to make some you know contacts and through playing make some connections and everything and i actually got opportunity to be in the um nba assistant coaches program and what they do is you know they reach out to you know former players and things like that and or i'm sorry they bring in former players and they prepare you to you know coach um and let you you pretty much see if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Um, so what I did was, you know, we went there in New York and we sat down and, you know, we talked and um, I was able to really see more so the off the court than the on the court because a lot of people think, okay, NBA is, you know, money, cars, all that stuff, party and everything. But, it's really, you know, the off the court things as well that really matter. You know, yes, yeah, a lot of money, but you know, how to, you got to know how to manage it. So I mm -hmm. think I really learned um, how to like, for example, not to say any names with the coach or anything, but the coach, he gave a good example of there were player. He was a current coach who came in and talked to us. He said, hey, so Sean, what if you have a rookie and he makes, you know, let's say at that time, minimum three or four hundred thousand dollars a year. And he's fine, no pressure. He's just a rookie, he's fine in his way. Let's say two years down the line, you're still his mentor and as an assistant, of course. And now they're making five to $10 million a year. How are you going to manage that mentally um, as far as him and you? Because now you have to come at him a little differently. And he's going to think differently now because he has more money. He has family. He has all these things going on. So how is your approach going to be? And I used to, I used to say all the time, I'm not going to change my mind um, towards him because it's just money at the end of the day. Um, now, he's going to probably think differently about some things because he has more access to do things. And some people, not all, but some people, you know, they spend and, you know, they have family members who want to do certain things. So we understand that. But I think that program as a whole was really good, um, just learning the off-the-court transition um, as well as on the court f from playing to me how how long did you actually end up coaching well i started in this system coaching program and what i did was um i would go in and i would like run um like i would help run the um combines you know they had like the nba g league combines i would be a coach for that um i actually got opportunity um down with the texas legends 
um, with, you know, the, the great coach Bob McKinnon, who coached down there for years. Um, also his dad, uh, Bob McKinnon Jr., coached in the NBA. Got to help him. Um, also, uh, the Dallas Mavericks uh, Basketball Academy. Um, you know, that was really a nice transition because, you know, my dad used to live in Dallas, and when we go see him, we built relationships with people in Dallas. So when I went down to Dallas and was helping the Mavericks do their uh, clinics and camps, you know, it was just like it didn't skip a beat, you know, with being familiar with the city and everything. Um, so I ended up getting an opportunity to coach after that in high school, um, coaching, you know, high school boys. So I think, like I said, being a player and then going into the transition of coaching through that program, it really prepared me mentally what to look out for and really understand that, um, you know, these are players, but at the end of the day, these are still people. It's more than just being, you know, an, an athlete. And I really think like, you know, LeBron and, you know, Maverick were really on to something when they said, you know, you know, it's more than an athlete, you know, be more than an athlete. Like that really resonates because a lot of people, like I said, you throw these athletes in a box, you know, like I said, you play. And it's like, you don't want to just be labeled an athlete. What you're doing now, you know, with, with this is amazing, um, especially getting other people involved and everything. I think that's great. And it shows that, yeah, we can do more than just, you know, dribble basketball and, 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 and you know, shoot a basketball, you know. I You know, I agree with that because I feel like, you know, a lot of people, no matter what level you're at, you know, from NAIA to, to NBA, um, even high school, you know, you're, you're always going to have people that look up to you because you play a sport. So, you know, God has given you this platform and I feel like it's up to us to really try to make a difference in someone else's life. 100% agree. You're right. After coaching, you, you know, you moved on and you started uh, Nothing But Net Sports. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so Nothing But Net was just um, a branch off of, you know, in my mind, what I learned over the years, you know, um, I was thinking in my mind, okay, how can I, you know, give back um, to the kids in, you know, Kansas City as far as training? So a lot of parents would come to me and say, hey, I got my son or my daughter, you know, what can I do? And at the time, I wasn't training or, you know, doing anything. So I was like, you know what, let me let me do this. Let me try, see, try to see if I can do this. So I reached out, you know, to uh, some community centers and one community center, um, in particular, you know, the Atlanta Community Center in Kansas, um, we just, you know, I told them what I would like to do, you know, I set up a camp and my first camp I actually had seven kids <laughs> for my first camp. And I was just like, okay, you know, for me, it was like, it wasn't about the numbers. It was about, okay, if my first one let's pretty much see how, 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 how this goes. And it went well, like the parents loved it. You know, the, the kids loved it. And actually a couple of kids even told me, they were like, you know what, we kind of like this camp because they've been to many camps, but it was like the camps with 200 to 300 to 400 kids, they kind of felt like they didn't get any attention, yep. you know? That's and that's what the feedback I got, even from the parents was like, yeah, we're, you know, we're paying all this money for camps, but we're not really getting any, you know, we, we don't feel like we're getting that one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to a and I said, well, hey, it was a great, you know, um, a, great, a great camp, I like to do more of these. And that's when they were like, hey, let's, 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 let's do this partnership. And that kind of grew to, you know, me. Um, I think that was in July. And then by December, we had set up a winter break camp. And then it just, the rest is history with that. I mean, we just started getting like maybe 60, 75 kids per. Um, and I'll kind of still, you know, we broke it up into different groups, of course. Um, but then the trainings came after that, individual workouts. And then the clinics, of course, came after that. So I really got an enjoyment and still do um, from working those kids out on a daily basis. Of course, now we can't because, of, you know, we're quarantined and everything with uh, COVID-19. But, you know, having the, you know, um, evenings and training those kids and seeing how hard they work and seeing them develop over the years, I think it's uh, it's been amazing to watch. And it's really, I started nothing but that as far as the health um, you know, just keeping kids active. Yeah. That was the purpose of it around the community, keeping kids active, keeping them in shape. You know, so today we have individual workouts, like one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, clinics, of course, the cams, and then we have performance training to where we do that for like, you know, youth and adults. So basically adults can come out and we do like, you know, workouts and workshops with 
adults, you know, as far as conditioning, cardio, um, and, and strength and condition, I bring in people, you know, um, like, you know, weight guys and things like that. And we, you know, get things going that way. You know, you're now the CEO of American Ballers. Do you, you know, will you tell everybody about that too? Because, you know, for me that, you know, that, that means a lot to me, um, this one right here, uh, just because, you know, I know the story. Well, American Ballers uh, came about, like I said, I think everything has a domino effect. So mm -hmm. to me, it came about um, from, you know, the camps and clinics that, that I've been doing, you know, helping, um, whether it was, you know, my dad or the Mavericks or whoever. Um, and the, the theme was always, okay, what I got from it was we're here to do a camp. And then it's like we leave. And some of these kids were in their same situations. So I looked at it like, okay, how can we give back in a way more so than just us giving like, you know, um, bags and T-shirts and things like that? What's something long lasting that, that they can get? And I remember in particular being in Florida, like maybe three years ago, and there was a young lady who was telling me that, um, I think at the time she was 14, and a, a story was that, you know, she, oh, I'm sorry, it was her guidance counselor who told us this, um, the situation that she was going through. Um, she was 14 at the time. She was living at home with her mother and her mother's boyfriend. I guess the girl had gotten uh, sexually assaulted from her brother, I believe it was. And she told her mother, mother didn't believe her. Um, so of course she hid herself and just like in the house, you know, she would put her music on, just like hide out. Um, and then I guess it happened again from an uncle. So now you have two people who pretty much violated this young girl at 14 or 15. And now, and she's come to our camps, so that, that was a, the, point of this she came to our camp so we see her all the time and we're like really that's what's going on because she never smiled that's what it was she mm -hmm. never smiled and we asked her, like why don't you smile you know what i mean what was, what, i asked her counselor why, why does this girl never smile she's very smart she's you know good player but she never smiles and that's what she told us that and i was like wow and then she also said you know her mom would you know smoking her her actually her mom and her boyfriend all they did was smoke weed at the house so at 14 years old i couldn't i couldn't imagine it i really couldn't and it really hit me with one of those stories, I mean, you heard a lot of stories, but that really was the one that we were like, okay, this is, yeah, you see a sweet girl like that, how can we really help? So that's mm -hmm. when I got the idea of, you know, American Ballers and okay, well, the thing I came up with, let's provide them with a scholarship. You know, yeah. maybe, even if it's not a basketball scholarship, it's something for them to get out of their situation. And then mm -hmm. that way they can use that to get into arts get into, um, you know, music, anything like that piques their interest. So what we decided to do was just, you know, we, uh, you know, go through di to different cities throughout the United States and, you know, hold free camps, you know, they're free, free camps and clinics. And, you know, we invite, you know, boys and girls and we're actually partnered um, with the uh, In School Bus uh, Incorporated and also Fair Opportunities Project. And what they do is they're based out of Massachusetts. And they're actually, the founders are Harvard graduates. And um, what they do is they provide free online uh, prep courses. with them and um they they were on board with what i was doing they enjoyed it um so yeah we've been we've been rocking ever since so we've been to um our first event was with the brooklyn nets we partnered with them and invited the kids from new york um out from you know all the different barrels um and then we went to orlando florida actually had actually i'm sorry in, in brooklyn we had my dad and my richardson who came out former nets players and then we had orlando magic um nick anderson and Chucky Atkins, who played there, um, we were able to go to um, the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, and film um, what they do with the youth academy out there. And actually, you know, Ms. Rambis, um, who was an executive with the with the Lakers, she actually invited me out there to do that. And I was very appreciative of that. And Ms. Keisha Nix, um, who's the director of the Youth Foundation. Um, so that was a good experience. And then we had two events 
um, in Chicago for All-Star Weekend, one at the YMCA and one at Dunbar Vocational High School, which um, Mr. Joe Sai and his wife Clara, who are the um, owners of Alibaba and also the owners of the Nets, came out, spoke to the kids. Um, they took us on a tour. So um, American Balls has, you know, been going strong um, since since we started. So we're keeping it keep keeping it going that way. You know, I, I really commend you for all of this because um, I can just tell how passionate you are about wanting to make a difference. I mean, you know, I appreciate that, you know, and I look at it like I've, I've been where these kids have been and not necessarily honestly as far as um, the physical struggle of some of these kids as far as, you know, assault and things like that. But I think we all go through things mentally at, at a young age you know, through adolescence and um, even in middle school and high school. So, and like I said, you being a player too, like I said, we all go through different things as student athletes. Yeah. So I think that for me, I'm really a, a case to like really express um, what it is to be a student athlete, you know, what to look out for, the thing, what you're thinking, you know, you have to, especially like in college, you're on the road, you play a game on a Tuesday night, you got a test on Wednesday morning, and especially, you know, whether it's a bus trip or a flight, you know, you got to get back and do your homework. So it's a lot of things um, that I think that's beneficial to being a student athlete, and I think that prepares uh, – it, it will prepare these kids mentally of the game of life, really, uh, you know, playing sports and other activities as opposed to just being a student, you know. You know, with anything, it's important to have, you know, a great circle around you. And I, I know American Ballers has that, you know, um, you know, me and my cousin, who I know is watching this, were able to meet Sharon. Um, you know, she I know she's in here as well. Um, you also have Dr. Juan Delegado. How important is it for you to have a mental health consultant, a part of your team and a part of these camps? Well, first thing, you know, Sharon, Sharon uh, Thomas Lelon, she's been awesome. You know, since this whole process, she's been with me since the beginning um, of this. And actually, she worked um, with Orlando Magic, and she's been around the NBA for about 20-plus years. So she also has her knowledge um, and things like that um, as far as, you know, just the industry and, you know, and all that. But I think, um, you know, Juan, Dr. Juan, um, he really, you know, I I'm really appreciative of him also because when I met him, we were actually in New York. And, at, you know, at the time he was working at the uh, sports science lab in New York City. And as you know, a main sports science lab to where, you know, guys go there for training, professional athletes, college athletes, they go there to get their, you know, training and all of that. So when he took us on a tour of the facility, this was maybe like two or three years ago, first time I met him, I actually thought that he was the person in charge. Like, yeah. because he, from start to finish, <laughs> He was running the show, you know? So he would show us this, show us that, show us this. So then finally, like, I think maybe the last hour, 45 minutes to an hour of the whole uh, presentation and the meeting, we finally met the two owners. And I was like, I'm thinking in my mind, I think I might have told either Sharon or my dad, I was like, I thought he was, he was the main guy. <laughs> like, this guy knows his stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So... Um, I think just being around him at that time and seeing all the knowledge he knows and everything um, for him to come on board with us, right. Uh, you know, with American ballers, it's amazing. And I think he has a lot to offer the kids mentally, because I yeah. think a lot of us, you know, like I said, we go through things as adults, but, and I think, and I know everybody's different. Um, but I think more so we can handle it, whether it's stress uh, you know, depression, anything that you're going through, you can handle, we can handle that a little bit more than your average 12, 13, 14 year old, because you don't know what they have at home. Mm -hmm. You know, they may not have that guidance or somebody to look up to to be like, how do I get through this? To have somebody put that arm around them, you know, and say, this is how you do it, you know? Yeah. So for him to be on board and be a mental health expert with things like that, I think it's great for these kids um, and so somebody to, you know, look up to. You know, and also, I need to throw in there also, you know, um, uh, we have um, uh, Peter De La Cruz. Um, you know, he 
you know, was involved in the Iris Foundation, um, which, you know, was about bullying and, and things like that. So having Peter and Sharon and, and, and you know, and, uh, and Juan involved, it, it, I think it's a lot of benefit more than just the basketball aspect of it. It's a lot of knowledge being thrown these kids' way. And I think it's re really good for the program. You know, along with everything you do, um, you're also a teacher for those with disabilities. Right. When did that, you know, when did that passion kind of start for you? Because for me, um, you know, that's what I kind of commend you most for because, you know, I have a, a big passion for those with disabilities and I look at, you know, us and we don't see many black males in the field. So when did that passion kind of start for you? Um, my mother being in education, you know, I think everything that I've been through sports and education wise have been, you know, fortunately, you know, with my parents, my dad playing basketball, my mother being an educator for over 30 years. So I kind of saw the approach of, you know, education, how important it is, how to handle certain things. So when I got of age, I was like, okay, I started seeing t temper tantrums in, you know, whether it was playing, like we were playing. Um, in high school, college, uh, professionally. And then even when you go to these camps, there's always a couple kids, you know, that are just like, you know, have their fits. You got to put an arm around them and everything. So I got into the field, you know, in high school, um, in special education. And I really enjoyed, you know, that was my way of giving back and giving my knowledge to them. Because I was always taught serve. You know, you serve people, you give knowledge, you want to you wanna give what was given to you, yeah. you know? So I'm, I'm giving hopefully somebody, you know, who's watching my knowledge, just like you, you're giving somebody your knowledge um, that was given to me, that was given to them and so on and so on. So I think the kids that I, you know, I'm involved with special education um, in the high school uh, sector is like, you know, every, every day it's a, I almost say it's a challenge, but it's, it's something different every week you know, you're dealing for with certain sure. things, but they were, you know, if, if they know you're real and they uh, know that you're sincere, they're going to respect you. Yeah. That's the main thing. I've noticed that my whole time dealing with kids, if they don't think you're real and they don't, you know, they think you're like phony, they're not going to respect you at all. They're not going to. And I think that's all about communication, mm -hmm. you know, talking to these kids and, um, you know, seeing where they're coming from, not really judging. Yeah. You know, that's what I was saying. I think, um, Speaking of that, I think for us, you know, no matter what field you're in, you know, I think that if we paid more attention to kids and listen to the kids and listen to what um, their needs were or are, um, we would be better off because they're the next generation coming up, yep. you know? So if we neglect them and we're just focused on working all the time and, and, and taking care of other priorities, instead of really looking out for the next generation coming up, then it's not going to be beneficial for us. Cause when we get like 60, 70, 80, and we've raised a bunch of you know, little monsters, yeah. you know, it's not going to, it's not going to be right. You know what I mean? So yeah, for sure. I think, uh, I think, yeah, j just me giving back and being real with these kids is, you know, I really give, I really get a benefit out of doing that. Um, my last question, you're also a high school basketball coach, which actually I have one more question after which level is, you know, most fun for you to coach at? Oh, wow. I say high school because the teaching. Now, of course, you know, um, to, you know, be able to, you know, be a part of, you know, the, you know, G League and do things like that. You're, you're managing. I don't say you're managing. Yeah, well, you kind of are managing. You're, you're dealing with grown men, yeah. which is fine. But we know it's, it's a business, mm -hmm. you know. And in my personal opinion, you know, and I, I dealt with it, you know, being a player and going through the minors and everything. I always say my funnest time of playing basketball, honestly, was in high school. Yeah. Those are the best days of my life as far as playing basketball was in high school because college, it, it, I mean, high school was fun. You know, college, you're on scholarship. It's still fun, but, you know, you're still, you, you, you're still a business in a way, and then pro is just as a job. Yeah, <laughs> so for sure. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, it's a job. So mentally, like I said, mentally, you have to be in a, a proper space 
to be like, man, I got to get up and, you know, professionally thinking, okay, I'm going to go out here. I'm going to do my job. Yeah. But I don't know what they're thinking over there in the front office. I don't know what they're mm -hmm. thinking, um, what their next moves are going to be. Um, so I think, yeah, to, to answer your question, I think giving that knowledge to the kids and, you know, in high school, they're innocent. You know, coaching high school kids was, you know, is great, um, to especially to see their progression. So from freshman to senior year, um, seeing them progress, you know, through through uh, the sport and also seeing them education wise. Yeah, you know, for sure. I you're agree seeing, you're, you're seeing them grow as a as a person. So I think, yeah, for me, it's definitely high school. My last question, you look at the NBA today out of guys you have not met. You have to pick three to have dinner with. Who are they going to who are they going to be? Guys who I have not met. I'd say that play in the NBA today or just yeah, that ever, play, right, that now? Play today. right now, right yeah. now, um, I say, of course, you know, Le LeBron, um, I like LeBron's, you know, of course, inside just, he's so smart, uh, basketball wise. I've not, you know, I've had a chance to see him play, um, multiple times, but never had a chance to meet him. Um, and especially what him and Maverick are doing. I had a chance to actually meet Maverick and talk to Maverick a little bit. We're in Chicago, so that was nice. But I would say LeBron, yes, uh, definitely he's won. Um, C.J. McCollum. C.J. McCollum, um, great business savvy, the way he yeah. thinks, um, what, what, what he's doing off the court um, is, uh, is amazing. Um, especially in his preparation. And well, that's a good question. That's, I know, I kind of put you on the spot with this. Yeah, that's a good question. Because <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of the guys who I haven't met. And also, uh, I say Kawhi. Yeah, listen, that, that, Kawhi's name just popped into my head. Yeah, I say that. Kawhi. Because Kawhi mentally – he came through pop and, you know, him being with San Antonio, you know, he's already thinking like, okay, structure, you know, is this, is that, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta play the, the game the right way, you know? And even though like, he's kind of like me in a way of, I'm an introvert a little bit. Yeah. Of course I can do, do this and we, we can have conversations, things like that. But more so my whole personality, I'm like an introvert. I'm, I'm, I'm quiet and things like that. So it's a, it amazes me how he can be a superstar like that in his whole career. You never hear anything bad about him. He always mm -hmm. does things the right way. He keeps quiet behind the scenes, but he wins. So I think with LeBron, CJ McCollum, and Kawhi, those would be great conversations at a dinner table to have um, about just basketball, doing things yeah. the right way, you know, serving people, giving back. Um and also business-wise, yeah. So yeah. I think th those would be my three. Man, you know, I just want to appreciate you for, you know, taking the time out to, you know, talk to me. It was a pleasure meeting you in Chicago. Um, you know, I hope this is something, one, that we can do again, and two, that we can stay in touch, and three, that, you know, we can keep making a difference in people's lives together. I hope that we can make that happen one day. Oh, no doubt, man. You know, I and I appreciate you, you know, um, you know, doing this and us, you know, coming together and, you know, for, for the benefit of the, the kids and just, you know, the culture and everything, you know, I, it's like I said, I'm really interested to see what's going to happen um, with, with, with the COVID-19, you know, it's like I was saying before, it's kind of, um, you know, it's different right now, but I think that, you know, that can give us time to write, really think about our next steps and things like that, you know, so I think that that'll be awesome if we can definitely do, do that. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited and uh, just want to say thank you again and, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. All right, Trey, I appreciate you, man. Thank yep. you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, no problem.